Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining in today to come and learn about textile preservation. This is a joint program that is hosted by the Houston Metropolitan Research Center and the Clayton Center for Genealogical Research. We're doing this program to close out HPL's Preservation Week 2022 series. Um, and if you haven't gotten the chance yet to see our Preservation 101 program, uh, the video should be up on Houston Public Library's Facebook and YouTube page. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be speaking to you today about the textile collections housed in our special collections libraries, introductory preservation methods for textiles, and how textiles can tie into family history research and preservation. Uh, just to take a second here to introduce ourselves, my name is Elizabeth Mayer, and I am the Preservation Librarian for HMRC. Um, I've been working here in Houston for five years, um, and I've been a textile creator for about seven years now. Uh, also presenting in today's program is Irene Walters. She has been a librarian for the Clayton Center for Genealogy for 25 years, and she's been a genealogical researcher for over 30 years and is a fourth generation textile creator. I wanted to start today's talk by going over some of what HMRC has in terms of textile collections. Uh, these collections provide a really excellent example of textile types that might be housed in family collections um, or even organization collections. Um, I do want to start by uh, saying that while we do maintain and house textiles that are donated as part of a larger collection, in general, textiles actually have a very different treatment and storage needs than book, paper, or even photo collections. So generally, we do not uh, seek out or accept donations of only textile materials. Um, that being said, common types of textiles that you might find within collections uh, can include costumes, uniforms, uh, flags, banners, um, tapestries, or even smaller items such as ribbons, handkerchiefs, um, and embroidery. Um, the first collection I kind of wanted to touch on a little bit today is the Heiser Albon Circus Collection. Uh, this is actually an exhibit that's, um, it's actually part of an exhibit that's up currently um, in the second floor of the Julia Idison building. It should be up through June of 2022, um, up there in the exhibit hall on the second floor. Uh, the two costumes that you see here on display um, are part of the exhibit, along with several photos, newspaper clippings, and circus posters. Uh, the Heiser Albon Circus Collection contains circus memorabilia of all sorts, particularly from around the 1930s, all gathered and collected by Joseph M. Heiser Jr., who was a considerable fan of the circus. Uh, the second collection that we have here, um, uh, hopefully pretty recognizable to um, people who are from Houston. Um, this is the Astrodome Memorabilia Collection. In this collection, we have an Astros Team Gear cardigan, uh, that, which you saw printed at the beginning of the presentation. This cardigan features the original vintage multi-striped logo design that has now resurged in popularity over the last few years. And the second item that we have is a complete space at uniform from the Astrodome. This uniform includes a quilted gold lame jacket and skirt, a pair of blue leather cowboy style high heeled boots, a small scarf, and a gold lame and felt pillbox style hat that was designed to look like a mini Astrodome. The space sets were the ushers for the Astrodome, and this uniform and um, all of the Astrodome uniforms were designed by Evelyn Norton Anderson, whose collection that we also house. Uh, the third collection I wanted to show is the Theater Lab collection. The Theater Lab is a small independent Houston theater, and it specialized in contemporary off-Broadway productions. Um, and among the programs and notes that we have in the collection, we have a box of needlepoint pillows, all made and designed by a theater lab patron named Kathleen Gay Peoples. Um, this needlepoint pillow was made um, for the production of Zombies from Beyond, and she made these for just about um, every production 
done during the, the run of Theater Lab. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about the Julia Idison collection. Um, this tapestry that you see pictured here is actually the same tapestry that can be seen in the portrait of Julia Idison that is hung in the second floor of the Julia Idison building. Um, along with this tapestry, uh, her collection also has several um, cross stitch and embroidery samplers. Uh, samplers, there are small pieces of cross stitch embroidery that were done as either practice um, or even small projects, and some of which were owned by the Idison family, and one piece was even sewn by Julia Idison herself. Uh, the final collection that I wanted to show is the Arab American Community Collection. Uh, this is actually one of our newer collections, and it is still being processed, so unfortunately it is not yet accessible to the public. Uh, but I did want to show the uh, rather beautiful quilt that we have as part of the collection. Um, the collection also includes a few additional textile samples such as lace, tablecloths, um, and other decorative home textiles. Uh, next, I really wanted to briefly touch on the subject of textile identification. Um, textile identification covers a combination of factors, including fiber identification and dye or paint identification. Um, some, but, um, some textile identification can be done um, visually or by feel. Um, for example, people can usually differentiate um, fairly easily between uh, textile types that are maybe protein based, uh, such as wool or if they're plant-based, such as hemp or flax, um, or if they're manufactured fibers, such as um, acrylic yarn. Uh, for specific textile identification, there are a number of different tests that can be done. Um, because all of these tests involve some level of destruction of the original textile, it is recommended that these tests should only be done by a conservator. Um, these include um, a burn test, which observes how a textile piece or a single fiber could respond to a flame. There's also a few different solvency tests um, involving a response to different solutions. Um, but every one of these methods does involve having to cut away at least a portion of the original textile. So it, you really want to be sure that you, you know you need to know exactly what um, textile type you have before going through with reaching out to a conservator uh, to do the full identification. Um, with that being said, why would it be important? Uh, different types of textiles are going to respond differently to different environmental factors. For example, some fibers are going to be more vulnerable to pest, identification, uh, pest infestation than others. So knowing which type of textile you're working with um, is going to really help determine how best to, to store uh, and care for your collection. And this is why it's really important to make note of any textiles that you're passing down to the next generation. That way they'll know how best to store and care for the textiles that you're passing down to them. Um, now on to the, the real preservation heavy portion of this pre presentation here, I want to talk about environmental concerns um, and the ways that different environmental factors are going to affect textiles. Um, so much like book and paper collections, textiles are incredibly sensitive to fluctuations of temperature and humidity. High temperatures actually speed up natural deterioration processes, um, such as chemical deterioration, and that all materials go through. It doesn't matter if it's a textile, if it's something made out of paper, um, even AV materials. Everything starts to go through a natural process of breaking down. Um, however, higher temperatures are going to artificially speed up this process. So trying to store them in a cool or even at least steady temperature environment is really going to be best. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, lower temperatures actually aren't usually as detrimental to textiles as they might be to book and paper collections. 
uh, book and paper collections in too cold of an environment might start to crack. Um, the big exception here would be any painted textiles. So for example, if you have a cloth with a painted design over it, if you put that in too cold or even freezing of a temperature, that paint is going to start to crack and flake away, uh, which is really something you want to avoid. Um, so for best preservation purposes, we really do recommend storing textiles around room temperature, which is going to be about 70 degrees, give or take about five degrees of fluctuation. Um, high humidity is almost even more of a concern uh, than high temperature, especially for textiles. Um, high humidity can create an environment that is ideal for mold growth and pest infestation. Um, and unfortunately, we live in a climate that is naturally very humid, so you really have to be aware of what kind of humidity that you have in your own home um, in terms of knowing uh, just how well your home is going to be suited for long term storage of materials. Um, so for humidity, uh, it is best recommended to keep your relative humidity between 40 and 60% and trying to keep that as steady as possible because fluctuation um, is almost even worse than having something that is consistently too high or consistently too low. Uh, light damage. Um, light damage uh, can often be overlooked, but its damage is permanent. Uh, light damage uh, preservationists like to say is cumulative and irreversible. Um, it can cause a large amount of color fading and it can weaken the fibers of the textile. Uh, as you can see in the example photo I have here, this is actually the uh, cross stitch sampler from the Julia Idison collection. The full alphabet is is sewn on to there in cross stitch, but um, most of the threads um, have faded away. Anything that isn't like a super dark color has faded to near obscurity at this point. Um, so light damage, it can be caused by both natural and artificial light. So it's best to keep any antique textiles away from direct sunlight um, and even to try and find UV filters um, for your own lights um, to try and protect from any kind of UV damage. There are several common pests that are dangerous to textiles. These insects will either eat or tear the material, um, or they will lay eggs within the fibers and leading to a full infestation. Uh, these insects include clothes moths, carpet beetles, and silverfish. Textiles that really attract the most pests would be materials with natural proteins. So this includes um, wool, so if you have any knitwear, um, hair, silk, fur, or um, even feathers. If you suspect that any of your collections has a pest infestation, it really is best to remove and isolate that item from the rest of your collection immediately, um, usually keeping that item in, say, a sealed plastic bag uh, will be really helpful for quarantining the item. And removing Full pest infestations should be done by a conservator, but pre preventing pest infestations can be done uh, simply by the storage method that you choose for your collections. Um, and finally, I wanted to close out my part of the presentation by talking about um, a few different tips for the care and handling and storage um, of your textile collections. Um, for storage, flat storage is really ideal for textile collections. Uh, this allows the weight of the textile to be distributed evenly, and it prevents uh, creases and folds from forming in the fabric. Now, if flat storage isn't possible, either due to um, space availability or really any reason whatsoever, um, rolling is usually an acceptable alternative for storage, so carefully um, rolling your textile around a support, making sure it's covered. Um, this is also um, helpful for heavier fabrics. Um, now, 
for long-term storage, you really want to keep your textiles in a cool, dark, and clean environment. Um, so this means keeping your collections um, covered, usually in, say, an acid-free box. That's going to go a long way towards protecting your materials from outside contaminants, um, light, temperature, dust, pests, um, all of these um, sources of deterioration. Um, it's also best to keep any food um, away from near where you're storing your materials, as this will help prevent any kind of pest infestation. Uh, usually the best places for, for storage would be interior rooms, such as closets uh, that would be away from windows or heat sources. Um, it's also best not to store your collections uh, on the floor and instead to actually keep them a few feet off the ground, and that's going to limit the risk of flood damage. Uh, you may also want to consider covering or wrapping your textile in acid-free tissue. As you can see in the photo here, we keep our circus costumes uh, carefully covered with acid-free tissue. This provides another layer of protection from light, dust, and pests, and it'll also limit direct hand contact when handling your textiles. Uh, the acid-free material also provides an extra barrier from outside contaminants uh, that might speed up the deterioration of the textile. So anything that might be naturally acidic, that acid-free tissue is going to provide a nice little barrier from that. Uh, some textiles, such as clothing or costumes, might need to also be filled up with either acid-free tissue or with any other acid-free um, filling material. Um, Oftentimes clothing can be quite heavy, so filling them, stuffing them with tissue might help evenly spread the weight um, of the fabric throughout the textile. Um, you saw earlier in the display photo of the circus costume that has been filled so that the, the beaded fabric um, is um, distributed evenly, that weight there. Uh, when handling textiles, it is best to either wear gloves, uh, such as you see me doing um, in this photo, or to wash your hands thoroughly before handling any textiles in order to remove some of the natural oils from your hands that might stain the fabric. Uh, for this reason, it's also best to avoid using any hand lotions or hand creams prior to handling textiles, as these will also likely leave a stain on your materials. Uh, when you're carrying a textile, it is best to support the weight as evenly as possible. Rather than picking a piece of fabric up from one or two um, points that may eventually become stressed and worn over time, carrying a larger item with the weight spread across your arms, or even using a board or a large poster board to carry your materials, will help to uh, keep the weight as even as possible. Uh, similar to books and paper, there are going to be natural weak spots in your textiles. However, unlike books and paper, these weak points might not be immediately obvious to the naked eye. So before moving, storing, or manipulating your textiles in any way, you want to be sure to carefully look at your material to see where any potential weak spots are. Um, for example, are there any frayed edges or runs in the fabric? Um, if the item's been hung on display before, are there any signs of wear and tear where the item would have been hung from? Or in the case of the circus costumes, um, for example, has the fabric been worn down or weakened around the areas where those plastic gems and any other decorative pieces would have been sewn? So all of these, all of these elements are really best to keep in mind before doing any kind of movement with your textile. Uh, and I wanted to close out my portion of the program by talking about some display tips um, for textiles. In general, it's best to display your textiles in interior rooms away from any doors or windows. This will protect your collections from both uh, light damage and environmental damage, such as wind, rain, or pests. Um, it's also best to display your materials away from heat sources, such as vents or fireplaces, if you have them. Um, you'll also want to consider only keeping your materials out on display for a short period of time, or perhaps even rotating which items you're keeping on display. This will allow your materials to at least spend some time in storage, um, at rest, sort of away from 
some of these environmental factors um, and will limit the amount of time it's exposed to light, to the open air, um, anything that would speed up the deterioration process. Um, lastly, I wanted to stress that it is important to be careful about which materials you are using to display your collections. For example, if you wish to frame your textiles, um, some wood and other framing materials could actually be damaging to your collections. So um, it's generally it's best to really choose your materials carefully. Um, generally, supplies for collections display can be found in the same places as supplies for collection storage. Um, and a few of these supply vendors I have listed um, on the handout, um, but even places like art supply stores are usually going to have safe storage options with acid free materials. So just be sure to look around and see what is going to work best for your display and storage needs. Um, so thank you very much again uh, for joining in. I will um, pass the presentation on over to Irene and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, at the end of the program. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was great. Um, I'm going to have to come down um, myself and see those ornaments uh, because I do. I stitch ones that are something like that. So. All right. Um, what I, my part of the program is I'm going to talk about our uh, textile preservation and bringing your genealogy and family textiles together. So uh, as you want to do that, you want to consider family textiles are those that are either made by and or owned by family members. They may um, they may not have come into the family by actually being made by a family member or they could still have or they could have been made by a family member and they could be things like clothes, bed coverings, household linens uh, or decorative textiles. So in clothes, we have special occasion clothes, uh, those that are made to be worn seldom only once or um, only a few times a year, such as wedding dresses and veils or marching uniforms such as military or band uniforms where the military uniforms I'm talking about in the special occasion ones are either the dress uniform or the uniform that um, a f veteran would wear to march in parades, to wear to their American Legion uh, or VFW post uh, dues, things like that. Um, christening gowns uh, can also, you know, are considered special occasion. Then everyday items uh, such as, you know, your father or mother's work uniform, um, a military uniform that they actually wore during active service, sweaters, mittens, whatever type of clothing um, that they might have had. Bed coverings such as quilts, that's the big one that most people think of when they're thinking of something made by a family member that stays in, um, that may stay in the family. Um, they may also have made coverlets or blankets. If you had someone who did weaving, you may end up with a coverlet or blanket. Uh, those who crochet or knit would make, make afghans for the family. Uh, you might have an afghan such as one of the ones I have in my family, which was made by one of my mother's classmates for their 50th class reunion. And my mom won it as a gift uh, at the as a door prize at the 50th class reunion. And I have it in my collection now. Um, pillowcases can be embroidered or the lace on the pillowcases. They were made for a long time as special gifts. Um, I have two sets of pillowcases myself that were made for my high school graduation uh, presents. One that's embroidered and one that is has the lace knit um, by my great aunt. Um, household linens. I put linens in quotes because many times these things will not be made of linen. 
Uh, you're going to have tablecloths that are embroidered or um, uh, or things done with them, like such as the hardanger embroidery, uh, lace edging on them, or just the li actual linen tablecloths and napkins that you might have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you may have towels uh, that are made from flour sacks uh, or made from different materials that are embroidered on or with lace put on them. Doilies, handkerchiefs, and decorative textiles such as tapestries, uh, embroidered pictures, throw pillows, or samplers. And these. Um, I have a lot of friends who have talked about doing their embroidered pictures or samplers or throw pillows, and they they always talk about how they stitch it for themselves. They're not stitching it for a museum, and that's one thing that we have to think of with all of our uh, family textiles. They mean something to us. They are part of our family. But they're not they were not created to become part of a museum, but they could. The sampler that is on the uh, right hand side of the uh, my screen is actually the Laura uh, Standish sampler that is made by Miles Standish's daughter, Laura, and it is the oldest made in America sampler in existence and it's made in the 1600s. Uh, it is, yes, it is in a museum now, but it kept, it went down in the family for quite a few years. It, it was in the, their family, the Standish family for, I think it was at least 200 years before it was, um, went to, ended up um, being donated to the Pilgrim Museum. You want to consider a textile's individual history um, it within your family, um, you, and you want to research it, and um, they're researched and written by the current owners. Sometimes you get a piece written by the pe person that made it or the former owner, um, but you want to consider who actually owned the textile in your family. Um, what is its importance? Was it the wedding gown? Was it the family christening gown? How do you actually care for it? Which uh, Elizabeth has um, presented us with a great explanation of how you care for it. Does that um, textile need conservation or preservation? Does it need to be um, just preserved because it's in great shape or does it need to be repaired, which is what the conservation would be? Also, who do, who actually owns it now and where might it go in the future? I forgot to add that one to the talk. Um, when was the textile made? Who made the textile? How was it made? Uh, was the textile actually made by somebody in the family or is it a um, purchased textile made um, by hand by someone else or by a manufacturer? Is it a, an original pair of uh, Levi's that were uh, that your family bought um, and uh, your brother wore them when he did the rodeo? Uh, how was it actually made and what is it actually made of? And Jennifer talked a little bit about what they're made of and what you need to do, um, you know, the pests, problems and like that, depending on what the uh, material is that a textile is made of. Textiles answers could be something like um, this, where it's my mom's wedding dress and veil, and my mom was Marie Bush Walters. She um, purchased it ready-made in Watertown, New York, so she did not make it, and grandma didn't make it. Uh, the veil was, was not bought as part of it. It was bought separately. And my grandma, Frances Becker Bush, actually all did the alterations on the dress for mom, and it's now owned by me. Some places you end up, um, I've seen uh, just a beginning history of an, 
of a textile. This is a baby sweater made by a paternal grandmother, and I actually saw something. I saw this on a genealogy blog, and um, the woman just said her, you know, my dad's mother had seven children, something like 37 grandchildren, 73 great grandchildren. She was always traveling and always creating something for us. I have a baby sweater and doll quilt she made for me, as well as two Afghans she made for my kids. Pretty good start to the history, but who is your dad's mother? What's her name? Um, about when did she make the baby sweater and doll quilt for you? And what were the uh, kids' names? At least that much more should be added to this beginning history of the baby sweater pictured here so that as it goes, uh, gets passed on, uh, that history can be maintained. We have uh, family fabrics can sometimes make a new textile object, uh, such as this quilt made with fabrics um, from a that were owned by a grandmother, uh, a grandmother's clothing, I believe the fabrics were, and they were made by that woman's daughter given to the granddaughter's uh, child, the, grand, the granddaughter for the granddaughter's um, birth of the granddaughter's child, I believe. And the uh, this is actually Elizabeth's family, uh, part of her quilt, uh, quilt collection. And but fabrics with a second life can be even more fragile than those in an object that is made with all brand new fabric. So you have to be take that in, into consideration when using the textile and displaying a textile because they those used um, or second life fabrics can be um, have been taken care of in different ways over their lifetime. So they might be even more fragile. Uh, the family genealogy is researched by family members and what you want to research for a textile object is who was the actual owner or maker. Give some life history about them. Um, and then how is the owner or maker related to you? So where does that the, the textile fall in the family? Is it your grandmother's? Is it your mother's? Is it your great grandfather's? Uh, or great 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 grandpa's Civil War uniform. And then how do you actually let everyone else in the family know about the textile and the family members? Because it's a single object usually. And how can um, you let everybody know it exists? And that what the special significance of it is. Well, you actually can use the sampler themselves to tell the genealogy. Um, this is a family register sampler by an Elizabeth B. Shattuck of um, Barry, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, made in 1836. And if you look closely, um, you might not be able to quite see it in on your screen, but the stitching where it talks um, about the various family members and their birth and death dates is um, in done done in different colors and there's not a death date for each one of the people. So it was it may not have completely been done by El Eliza. It may have been by, done by her and then her daughter granddaughter adding information to it. And um, a Brooks family record sampler, same same type of thing. It was the family of Jonah and Safrina Bradford Brooks. We do not know who exactly in the family made this, but they were the parents of eight children born between 1828 and 1846. And it looks like it was stitched in stages over approximately 66 years because the old the earliest date on there is um, the date of their marriage, uh, the dates of the children from 1828 to 1846 look to be stitched at the same time, but the latest date is 1923 for the death of one of the children. 
So you can use your genealogy resources to research the textile. You can use census records. U.S. federal census from 1790 to 1950 are available to do research with here at Clayton Library. Some of, um, some of them are available. You can do it from home using your Houston Public Library card or on other sites. Um, uh, other than the Houston Public Library sites to get to some of them, the databases. You can look at the vital records, the birth, death, marriage records. If you have something like a wedding dress, look at the vital records to see when did the couple actually get married. Look at newspaper databases. Uh, the clip on the right is just a clipping from a newspaper, from my hometown newspaper talking about my mom's great aunt who was celebrating her 100th birthday and there was a long write up about her and it said in her younger days Ms. Uh, Mrs. Higby washed, carded and spun wool for blankets taking the yarn to a shop of a nearby weaver to be loomed and she recalled that her mother had a small wheel hardly more than three feet high but that she used a larger one. Um, that loom and any textiles that um, Aunt Maggie Higby, um, great, 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 it's like great, great Aunt Maggie Higby used um, have not come down on my part of the family. Uh, I will have to actually search for her grandchildren and great grandchildren to see if uh, any of them came down on their side so I could maybe get a picture of them to include with information about um, Maggie. But um, I got that from the newspaper and I did not know that part of my family um, had done anything textile. I knew a, a different line. My my straight female line had done, been for four generations textile um, creators. Military records. When did um, your person actually serve so that you can put that with the um, uniform? What did they receive medals for so you can describe those medals uh, better? Uh, look at family photographs and family scrapbooks to see if they have information and also anything else that you use to study your genealogy. And when you're studying your genealogy, um, just as a quick thing, you want to search from yourself back towards the owner or maker because you search from what you know the most about, which is you and your parents and then your grandparents. Um, back towards the actual maker. If you try to search straight uh, down from the maker, if you know who the maker was, you may be able to be, uh, bring it down to you, but sometimes it's harder to do it in that direction. With the textiles, you want to document the names for each person involved with the textile, document the dates that the, of the textile and the people, and document places the textile would have been made or used. And then label your textiles. Uh, tell the who, what, when, where, and why of the object. And uh, for most textiles, some sort of cloth label that is attached without pins is best. The pins will rust no matter what they're made of. You will get some form, uh, unless they're solid gold pins, um, they're, they are going to rust and uh, sometimes it happens really quickly and sometimes it takes a while. Um, a few stitches with um, a compatible thread just to hold the, the label to the textile, especially if it's a textile you're not going to wear um, or use every day um, that will keep that those few stitches will hold that label to the textile and keep it from getting lost. You can handwrite them, embroider them, or have them commercially generated, such as the made with tender loving care uh, one at the bottom. Uh, the quilt my mother made me for my 25th birthday is got exactly that same one, except it has her name on it. And those were commercially made. So at least there's something about who the maker was. But when you actually write up the history of your textile, you want to keep that written history with the textile. 
and you want to tell the story of your textile because everything has a story as well as everyone. And so your textile family tree to pass down, document it. Take pictures to so show the current condition. Uh, write the story and keep it and copies of the documents with the textile. If you put them in acid free folders um, and you can print them off onto acid free uh, paper and you can store that right in the box with the textile and it won't um, hurt the textile. Um, and then also add the story and the documentation to your genealogy records. Such as my mom's wedding dress. The story that I've written for it so far, I'm going to, I will add some more detail to it later. Um, it was bought by my mom, Marie Bush, in 1946 for her wedding. That was October 9th, um, 1946 in New Bremen, New York, to my dad, Earl Carl Walters Jr. In the wedding announcement, which I clipped and put right there. Um, that's just part of the wedding announcement, but it actually describes the gown and what it was made of um, and, and the veil. I know my mom went to Watertown, New York to go shopping and she went with her mom's older sister, Martha Becker Strong, because aunt, um, great aunt Martha worked in the department stores in Watertown and she actually got mom a deal on the dress. They found that fingertip length veil first and then went to a, uh, the store that um, great aunt Martha worked in to find the dress and the veil cost twice what the dress did. And I believe the whole cost of the uh, veil and the dress, I have to double check my sources, uh, my what mom had told me, but I believe the whole cost was between 50 and $60 total in 1946. Um, but it had a two foot train that my grandmother actually had uh, mom try down the dress and my grandma knelt down and just cut the train off. They decided they didn't like it and she hemmed it up. Uh, and I have a picture to go with it of my mom standing on a stool with that train coming around her. Um, I got the dress after my mom died and I have the date of her death and my name. So this story, I can copy it right like this and put it in my family um, genealogy software along with a clipping of the newspaper um, the newspaper announcement the a photo of the wedding dress uh, as it looks now the photo of mom and dad on the wedding day and the picture of mom before grandma cut off the train and so everybody can see it even though none of her Neither of her daughters nor her granddaughters or great granddaughters probably could wear this dress because mom was the skinniest thing you'd ever imagine. And then in closing, um, I want to let you think about this, that textiles are uh, the tangible and visual reminder of our ancestors lives. They were real people. They really existed. They lived and got dressed every day slept under blankets just like we do. We should preserve the textiles for, um, very carefully, but we also should remember to tell their stories because in telling their stories, we tell our story. So I'm Irene Walters from the Clayton Library Center for Genealogical Research here in Houston. Uh, and is, this has been me and Elizabeth Mayer from Houston Metropolitan Research Center, Texas Room Reference, uh, both with Houston Public Library. And uh, if you have any questions about textiles or genealogy uh, preservation, call us, ask us. And I'm going to open it up uh, to the questions that you might have about today's talk. Thank you.